Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. My books, Beyond the Lines and Beyond the Game, are about leadership, character, and creating a superior culture of excellence, which is what this show is all about. My special guest today is a martial arts grandmaster who fought against Chuck Norris and became friends with Bruce Lee. He is the legendary Sifu Al Dacascos, and today we are going beyond martial arts. Hey, Sifu Al, welcome to Beyond the Lines. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for having me on. Oh, Sifu Al, you have so much wisdom, and I, I'm so excited to talk to you about so many things today. And I know that you grew up in Kalihi. How was it growing up in Kalihi? <laughs> Let's go back. Uh, you're talking about uh, uh, 1960s. I mean, there wasn't too many houses out there. And you know the word Kalihi means the edge, don't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And and being the edge of the city, I mean, going up into the valley, there were hardly anybody up there. I mean, at the end of my street from in Kalihi Valley on Nihi Street, beyond that, going heading towards the mountain, there was no subdivisions, no nothing. We were probably the last one or two houses up there in the valley. So, you know, there was really nothing to do except with the the other the other delinquents that I would say that was hanging around in the area. Uh so growing up in that part was, you know, the old days, yeah, pretty much barefoot, you know, and um, pigeon language. Hey, brother, what are you doing? You know, come in, all that kind of stuff, you know. And then we go to the mainland and the language begins to change. <laughs> so, Sifu Al, how, how did you start getting interested into martial arts? All right. Um, I, I, let me just make a small, small indent right now. Just call me Al, okay? Um, <laughs> uh, Sifu, you know, I, Sifu, you know, is a Chinese word for teacher, but I have a lot of feelings about that. And when we're talking like this, you know, I'm just L, you yeah? know. Um, now, as far as getting into the martial arts, it was sort of like ingrained into me because at the first I lived and grew up with my grandparent, uh, parents on the island of Kauai. And, and um, my grandfather, we lived on a place called Camp 7, which is, uh, you know, where he did all this sugar cane cutting and things this way because on the island of Kauai, you know, they had camps, you know, Okinawans were there, Japanese, Chinese, and Portuguese in there, and the Filipinos had their own camps. So we had Camp 7. And growing up in Camp 7, I got into the martial arts by watching my, my grandpa. Matter of fact, you know, about five, five o'clock, seven, uh, five to seven, uh, seven o'clock in the morning or around that time, he and his group of people would, pra would be practicing martial arts. Um, in sort of like circle, you know, the houses was all around, but you have a slight sort of like a circle that it was like, for me, it was like a big arena, but it's actually a big parking lot. I mean, I'm looking at it now at about four or five years old. So everything then is big, you know? Um, and watching them do the Filipino fighting art called Esprima or Kali was very interesting. I knew nothing else, but just watching that. And the Filipino fighting arts of Esprima and Kali is actually using weapons, you know, and th those times because they were, uh, you know, cutting sugarcane, they were using bolo knives, you know, they were those knives that they would cut in the sugarcane fields. And that became a norm. And sometimes when they would practice without the, 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 the bolo knife, then they would practice with sticks that were averaging about the length of your hands, anywhere between 26 to 29 inches long, and they would, we would, they would practice it. And yes, naturally, I would just kind of practice. I, I didn't really knew what, uh, knew what I was doing. Well, I actually never knew what was going on. It's just that everybody else was doing it, so it just became ingrained in me, just watching that. Eventually, I got into the, the other arts as I moved from uh, Kauai uh, to Oahu. So, so Al, your family, I want to ask you about your family. I mean, you, you have a beautiful family, your, your kids and your grandkids, do all of them know martial arts? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> matter of fact, all of them. Uh, if they wasn't formally taught, they was watching all the time what we were doing. So, you know, it became something that 
for normal. I mean, for any reason, they, they never even knew that it was learning martial arts. It was just like playing soccer or, or you know, things like that. So, yeah. Now, Al, you know, you've been on tons of magazine covers. I mean, throughout all these decades. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to me. Um, what, are, what are your principles that you teach in martial arts? Well, and you be talking about our values, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, first is going to be integrity, loyalty, honor. Um, these are pretty much the core. And then from then come other uh, principles. We really start off with that, you know. Then we come discipline, self-respect, self, uh, you know, self-esteem, and all the others that combine into it. You know, getting into virtues is, there are tons of virtues, so many of it. And, you know, like I always encourage my students, I just put up maybe two or three of them and let that go into the head and just let that manifest in, into something strong. Once they have that, then, you know, we lead on into something else. When I was teaching in Portland, Oregon, um, every Monday on the bulletin board before they go into class, I would have a virtue that we would talk about. And we would drill on the virtues all day. Uh, all week, and then the following Monday, they would repeat after, uh, repeat what they saw, the sayings, and how it had helped them. And um, the virtues actually was a heavy part in uh, in the martial arts because it's character building. Uh, you got to build up the good character, or else you know the martial arts it's only going to the physical part. You need to have you're going to have to have the, the moral and the ethical and the spiritual all combined to actually develop some good students. Like you, I, I, I read your book and I mean, you, you use the four Ps, yeah? um, which, which, is, which is great. And I can see how you know, we cross over on a lot of things, we parallel a lot of it. Um, and I guess with people going into the, the field of coaching, you know, we also uh, play many different roles. I know that, um, I, I like the word coach, but I also like the word educator <laughs> because you know the difference between a teacher and a coach and an educator. And so I don't like to put myself too much in a teacher's role because it's only one-sided. You know, I like to be as an educator that's 24 seven and then, and be with them so they can come at me at all the time, you know? Yeah. Anyway, that's uh, the way that we built up the virtues and, uh, and like you, um, I've jumped on a lot of people that never, uh, never told the line. I mean, I never uh, made them do 150, 100 push-ups or anything that way, uh, like the way you did. <laughs> <laughs> we did, we did push-ups, but we would put weights and we would sit on the back, <laughs> yeah. you know. And maybe now and then, slap them on the face and say, oh, "Do you feel that?" No, that's not, you feel that. <laughs> it's just that you know, in the martial arts, you have to desensitize them because they're going to get hit anyway. You know what I mean? So it, it was sort of like um, a teacher at first, teaching him something and then coaching later. Al, you know, I read your book and you're, I really love the stories in your book. And, and uh, I want to ask you if you can tell me about your connection with Bruce Lee and how you both ended up becoming friends. Oh, okay. That's, uh, that's a story in itself. Yeah. Um, when I lived in California on the street, well, not on the street, <laughs> actually in San Leandro, California. I had a school on East 14th Street. It was a storefront school. And um, I lived in the back. Um, and, um, and it was on a Sunday. And, you know, you can see inwards because there's all like, you know, uh, showcase windows first. And you could see in, but uh, I mean, I could see out, but they couldn't see in because it was dark. And um, I just happened to, you know, get up and just walk into the office, to my, my front office. But as I was walking, I saw this two Chinese guys looking in inside, trying to see what was going on in there. And I recognized the face and I didn't actually uh, know who they were. I just recognized the face and I didn't, I didn't put it together until a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks, well, uh, couple, couple of weeks later. I was performing with my students um, at the Oakland Coliseum. We were doing demonstrations. And as we were doing demonstrations on stage, 
I saw these two Chinese guys sitting in the front row, legs crossed, you know, hands crossed. And one of them was smoking a cigarette, which was James Lee because he was a very heavy smoker. And then this other Chinese guy with this thick glasses. And I knew, I said, man, that, that looked like the guys that was watching and looking at my, 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 in the window. And uh, after I did my demonstration, um, they got up and left. I think they only came there to see me perform. And at that time, you know, being, 26 years old, I was pretty feisty. I could jump up there, I could do kicks. And I did a multi-man attack where I had um, eight people attack me. And I did demonstration, just did flow and everything. And after that, the demonstration, they left. That's the only reason why they came there. And the way that we actually became friends was just that my school was lo located, located in Oakland and his, uh, no, excuse me, his school was locate, located in Oakland and mine was located in San Landro, just a few miles away. And um, I had very good students, so did he, he had good students. And at one time, one of my students and one of his students met at a party and they got into a confrontation about, you know, oh, I, I take, you know, Kung Fu from C4L, they said, well, I took Kung Fu from Bruce Lee. And, and they started going back and forth and explaining ideas and, and things. And, and it was that my, my student actually got the best of him, a Bruce Lee student, because Bruce Lee student was practicing what they call Wing Chun, style of Kung Fu, which is straight in, going straight in. Ours, we don't use that, the concept, because you're going straight in, going against power against power, it's not gonna work. Okay, so our type of defense is angles and then come in, slip off to the side. So as his student came in, my student went off to the side and dropped him. You know, the fight actually escalated. And after it was done, it was like, you know, our school is better than your school and blah, blah, blah. Now, on top of that, there was a party that was going on at the same time, you know, well, which, which was the same party. And they had said that, yeah, well, C4L had knocked Bruce Lee off his horse. Now, when they say knock a person off his horse, in Kung Fu or Karate, they stand into what we call a horse stance, you know, standing like this. And, and, and C4L came and hit Bruce Lee, and Bruce Lee was knocked off of balance, okay? The problem that they had a lot of noise and music at the same time, and what they did was they mistook C4L, me, for another C4L, C4L Novak. Now C4L Novak was over 300 pounds, so he could easily knock Bruce Lee off his horse. I was 125 pounds. I mean, that's a different story. Bruce was about the same at that time, about 125, both of us were about the same, same thing. So the word started to go around town that C4L beat Bruce Lee. And that went on for about a year and a half. And, you know, it was sort of like escalating. And, you know, when rumors pass from one person to the other, all it does is just get like, yeah, he beat his butt and all that kind of stuff. And, and naturally, you know, I'm thinking, oh man, this is really getting bad because it looks like I'm going to have to really fight him. Yeah. Um, and um, so it was, it was a, about a year and a half later um, that I did, competition at the International Karate, Chip, uh, Karate Championships in Long Beach, uh, California. And I was doing a form competition. You know, forms is just like uh, gymnastics, you know, you know that uh, what they call it, single gymnastics things. And I was doing my forms and everything this way. And I had won. And, and I was, as I was getting my trophy, I saw Bruce Lee sitting down in the front row you know, blue, blue jacket, uh, uh, white, uh, white uh, 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 pants, you know, and just kind of looking at and just doing this, you know, like that, you know, and I look at him, I just kind of nodded and everything else this way. And I was thinking, oh boy, I think he's going to meet me right afterwards and we're going to have a confrontation. <clears throat> so after, after I got my trophy, I went straight down to him and he says, hey, Bruce, you know, there's, um, there's things that go going around up in Northern California about you and I, you know, and he just kind of looked me, look at me and just kind of put his hands on his hips a little bit and just kind of just had that kind of look at me. And I think, whoa, here we go. 
So I put my trophy down and I crossed my hands. You know, I'm just kind of waiting for things. And he said, you know what, Al, don't worry about it. It's us. We don't make trouble for ourselves. It's the students that make trouble for us. And I look in, in, in me, I'm going, whoo, that was good. <laughs> you know, so, 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 so we shook hands and he was, he, he, we, he would talk and, and he said, you know, by the way, he said, I know the form that you did. It's called Lohan Pyun. I said, yep, that's absolutely right. And, and I told him, well, I thought you don't like forms. He said, yeah, well, I used to forms. I used to do forms before, you know, and uh, we started talking. And, and then we went into the lobby and we stayed for about two, three hours just talking and we made the connection there. Um, that's how we started. And over the, over the, year, over the years or months, it was just like casual things, notes back and forth until he went to... Uh, um, where did he go? Hong Kong. Yeah. And started to, to get named. Actually, he was doing the Green Horn. And I think at that particular time, he had just done maybe one or two episodes of, of, of the Green Hornet. So we saw him jump up in the air and kick all that and was really fascinating. And Ed Parker, who was a promoter at that time, was promoting uh, Bruce Lee, you know, Cato, you know, in, in the Green Hornet. So, you know, his popularity was coming up in the... Um, the into, uh, in, into the film industry. Mine was coming up in demonstrations and competition. Two people promoting martial arts or Kung Fu at that particular time, but in different areas. You know, we became friends that way. And then when he passed on, um, I can remember the day he passed on, I was actually living in, in uh, uh, Denver, Colorado, sitting down and the news flashed that, you know, Kung Fu movie star Bruce Lee passed away and total shock. And uh, so within, within three weeks, you know, a couple of people that I knew in San Francisco, we got on the plane and got, get on the plane and headed out towards uh, Hong Kong. And it was just a total mess there. I mean, you know, I mean, so many newspapers was getting into business because they was promoting, uh, promoting Bruce Lee and the rumors they had with his, with his actress and so forth was going on. And, but I had first-hand account of actually what was going on because that eventually, you know, uh, Linda Lee and the family, you know, they came, we became very close and they were telling me all kinds of things. And Brandon Lee, the, the son, and Shannon and uh, Linda used to come up to uh, uh, Denver, Colorado and go skiing with us. So it was like, you know, after he had passed on, I think the family is going to kind of grew close. Mark, my son, Mark and Brandon Lee, got close until Brandon Lee himself got, uh, he passed on. So it was something like that, yeah. Al, I find it so fascinating, you know, that how you guys <laughs> had like these rumors about you guys uh, happened and then, and then it was just, you know, how you connected and then became friends and then you guys have that mutual respect with each other. And early, I wanna talk to you about my books real quick, uh, Al. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you mentioned earlier about the four Ps and you know how I talk a lot about creating that superior culture of excellence. And, and that's really what, what you're about. That's what Bruce Lee is about. What, talk to me about your culture of excellence that you're trying to, to establish in your schools for all these uh, decades. Well, we, have, we go to the, what I call the first five phases um, of learning. And I, say, I, go to, I call it primitive, mechanical, technical, creativity and fluidity, the process of learning, for me anyway, you know, um, everything as, you, as I say, you know, it's actually perspective and sensibility anyway, you know. So when I talk about, you know, persons coming into the school and learning, you know, they are very primitive, know nothing about the martial arts and sometimes have nothing about uh, character building. So it's so primitive to them when I talk about integrity, when I talk about um, honesty or loyalty or things this way. And I have to be able to teach them that. So, you know, from the primitive stage, it becomes the mechanical stage, like pull out your book. This is the page you're gonna learn and so forth and this way. Then it becomes technical, how, when, why it works. Then because they understand this, the first three, then I say, okay, now it becomes creative. How can you be creative and use the principles of loyalty in your life? Or how can you show honor or respect or love? Well, now you know creativity is now is thinking. When you begin to start thinking all of that, they said, okay, now that's great, you got it. Now, how can you be fluid and just let it flow out of your life? How can it be so natural? You know, I said, 
you know, it's got to come with passion. And when you do things, you got to have that vocal, that tonality, that facial, that body language to, to, to put it all together. So once they get that, you know, I said, okay, now we're going to another five phase. And the other five phase is being aware, being first, being fast, hit hard, and don't stop. That's martial arts, martial arts thinking, okay? But let's go ahead and put it into a different way. You know, be aware. I said, be aware of what? I said, be aware of your surroundings. Be aware of the people that you're connecting with, the way you're talking to them, the way they respond to you. If you're out on the street, be aware of your environment in the sense of, you know, you may be attacked from the blind side or, or front side or things this way. Or if you're into business and you're into stock, you better be aware and get up early at three o'clock in the morning, get on the New York Stock Exchange and become to find out what is going on. Going on. Be aware. I mean, be aware can be a lot of things, you know, about your health, your everything else. And then comes be first. Naturally, you got to be first. Because, you know, if you're not up there just punching in, I mean, you're going to be where the bottom of the line. It's just like going to a buffet. You know, I say, I'm going to wait. And by the time you get there, there's nothing. Okay, so you got to be somewhere in between or in the front. Okay, be aware, uh, uh, be first. And then it is that whenever you do things, it's got to be fast now, right now, be fast. Okay, so that can go into many different areas. And then once you're into that be fast mode, the next step is hit hard, which means actually put in the full energy into it, put in the passion, do it, just, just do it. Okay, and then the last one is don't stop. That means a consistency. So you're putting all this together in all that type of, I mean, it works in great. It works in business and in, 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 in relationships and uh, uh, business and martial arts, especially. And when I put them into that sense, then they understand that, you know, heck man, I'm getting into this competition over here that, you know, and competition for me is kind of, kind of different and you know this you know on competition you actually know who you're going against so, you know you know the school you're going against or you know the person you're fighting you know his weight you know his history you know everything about him how he's been training and everything but out of the street it's what you call ambush attack that really gets you because you don't know who this person is and what he has so that means i have to be double aware of the environment because this person might be you know, a 300 pound gorilla, you know, and, and uh, he's probably got a whole family behind of him. So that means if even if I beat him up, I got to worry about grandma who's going to hit me on the head with a frying pan, you know, and his cousins. So all of this is totally different. The, the part that is competition and sport versus what's out in the street, because out in the street, you know, like in a tournament, I understand this. I always used to tell my students, you said, when you get into a tournament competition, yeah, you got to think as if this is your last fight. In, in tournaments, in tournaments, you know, you have a first place, second place, ch grand championship, everything. In war, second place is dead, okay? Yeah, that's dead, that's it. So you got to be able to put yourself, you are, this is that, this is the, you, you put your mind, frame of mind and go all out. So if you understand, be aware of what's going on, you know, be first, hit hard. Uh, 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 let me see, let me start again so you get it, okay? Be aware be first, yeah, be fast, hit hard, and don't stop. These are the principles, or what I say the golden nuggets that I instilled into them, as well as basically you can see the spiritual and the emotional and ethicals all come into it. And it and it's interwoven so 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 much into the fabric of their learning that we can't take it out. It is there. Um, you know, it's funny that when you get into a school and they call me Sifu, you know, I'm not a really coach at that time. I am a Sifu because it's a teacher role. I tell you, you do, you don't answer back, you just do. But then after they get out of school, I turn into the educator and, and a coach where I said, okay, now you already got all these technical skills over here. And, and now let's sit down and figure out how we can make it work for you because you know, Everybody's different. I mean, you got people that to be extroverts and introverts, and that's pretty much, you know, observation and then let them talk. And as much as they talk, you know, in a court of law, they say the first person that talk loses, you know, and, <laughs> and it's the same thing too. I'd let him talk. 
you know, I'll just find out everything that he got, you know, and then I said, okay, now I can assess what he has and just take it from there. Al, your son, Mark, you know, is, I mean, he's been on a ton of movies. He's a great actor. He's a martial arts master. I, I loved his role on Hawaii Five-O as Wolf Fat, and then he was the <laughs> chairman on Iron Chef. Why, yeah. why is Mark successful? What? Uh, childhood. Yeah. Uh, everything started from childhood. I mean, you know, uh, my wife and my wife and I, I mean, came, you know, my wife was a martial artist, you know, she became a real good martial artist. And we, you know, we already instilled into the kids, the discipline, the respect, uh, integrity and everything and humbleness and humility. And, you know, he's known among his, among his uh, colleagues in the acting world. He's very humble. You know, I mean, he don't go around bragging or you know, things this way. He knows it. What? He don't have to brag. He already know what he can do. You know, so it's the idea is just that, you know, he was trained so well that, you know, he was he was really well, well prepared. Um, we instilled with him. So he saw a lot of things. And, you know, with my my wife and I, you know, sure, we would argue and things this way, but it was never in front of the kids. You know, they never saw that part. What they saw was, oh, they're so loving, they so things. And, you know, so in other words, it was part of them. It was only when they got a little bit older that they kind of understand that nothing is really black and white. I mean, like a yin yang. I mean, there's always, in the, in the white fish is always going to be a black eye. You know, so I kind of explained to them, I said, nobody's perfect. You see, but we give you this idea, you know, and this year so that you start off good this way. Because, you know, in the early stages, you know, this is where you, it's a teaching stage, you know, one to six or one to eight years old. This is where they, everything is being absorbed. Matter of fact, you know, um, today, right, uh, just before coming, I was ironing my shirt, okay? And I always think, I am so lucky because when I was young, my mom taught me how to iron my shirt, you know, how, how to clean the house and how to cook and everything. I said, you know, it was this kind of teaching that stayed, it stayed with me. So she was the greatest, greatest influence of, of, of me learning good. My father was a disciplinary, you know, that's when I saw the belt and the stick, you know. Um, but, but for my mom, you know, and my kids, you know, they were brought up this way. And yeah, I did spank Mark and Craig a couple of times only because they got out of hand. And, you know, they say in the Bible, you know, don't spare the rod. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just so I lie down, get on your stomach, bam. Oh, daddy, don't hit me. I said, okay, now you remember now. You're not going to be riding out on the street like that, the way without your helmet on and so forth, whatever. It was that, you know, well, that was kind of a discipline that we had. But after that, I would feel so bad. And I never did. After that time, I never did. Never to hit my kids. I mean, if I did that now, I'd probably be in jail for child abuse. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say, Al, you know, spanking, it, it worked. And I want to ask you one more thing before we wrap. I mean, sure. I, could, I could do three hours with you, Al. I mean, you have so much wisdom. But I want to ask you about the difference between a warrior and a fighter. I mean, you're known worldwide. I mean, the, the Costco's name ha is highly respected on, on the entire planet. But what is the difference between being a warrior and a fighter? Okay, let's, let's put it this way. Yeah, um, I get into tournaments and that's, in, it, that I'm a, comp a competitor, I'm a fighter. You know, because I'm fighting for a trophy, okay? That's, I'm fighting for an honor or a, a, a reward or something this way. And sometimes I fight for cash as a fighter. Hey, you want to fight in this tournament? Uh, well, how much? Uh, maybe a thousand. Okay, I'm going. You know, I'm a fighter. You know, warriors. On the other hand, he has a lot of principles. He fights for a cause and a reason. You know, I'm just. I'm not just going to go fight over there to beat up this person over here. He's got to hold up to my morals and my integrity because I got to live with this. You see what I mean? So there's a separation between a warrior and a fighter. A fighter will go for anything. A warrior, you know, he's a little bit more uh, into staying up to his moral and ethical virtues. No, that makes sense. That's well said. And Al, I want to thank you so much for taking time to join me on Beyond the Lines today. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Anytime. And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. For more information, please visit rustykomori.com. And my books are available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I hope that Al and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.